Think back to 1957. No, I was not there. The Russians just launched a, a satellite called Sputnik. This caused a uh, great desire for our country to want to invest in mathematics and science. In fact, our president, JFK at the time, made a bold uh, claim that we would be on the moon by the end of the 60s. We needed to hire people who could be what was called human computers. And I'm sure many of you have seen this story portrayed in the film Hidden Figures. Now fast forward to 2018. I have the opportunity to visit classrooms all over the state of Arizona, and I see students doing much the same kind of mathematics that was necessary in 1957. And what I see is students computing. And so just as a something to humor myself, I think, I wonder if I could accomplish the same task using an app on my phone. And most of the time I can. In fact, trust me, I'm a mathematician. 92.3% of the time, I can accomplish what's being taught on my phone in the back of the room. And that makes me wonder, what year is it? Is it 2018, or have I gone back to the future and it's early 1957? Now, this is going to connect. There's another thing that happens in my life very frequently. Do you ever meet people for the first time and they say, what do you do? And I got to be honest, I kind of shudder inside when I'm asked that question because I know what's gonna, what it's going to lead to. So I start with, I'm a teacher. And I know in the, in the image of the person who ask, is asking me this question, they're probably thinking about this cute, he's an elementary teacher, and he's probably poor. Then he asks, what do you teach? I mean, where do you teach? And now I know it's going to get serious. I say, well, I teach at a community college. And now that conjures up all new images of what I do. Probably images of me standing in front of students and boring them to death as I teach them whatever my content area is. But notice, I've not yet said what I teach. I wait until the last question. Well, what do you teach? And I know it's going to get bad then. I say mathematics. <laughs> and the reaction is lots of symbols, and it doesn't make sense, and these, these images, I, I'm just sure, flash in the mind of this person. Images of meaningless computations, images of frustration, images of passive learning while the professor professes, images of giant lecture halls with lots of symbols on the board. Now, we are trying to do things to address that in 2018 with technology, but I, I wonder, are we using the technology properly? We have smart boards now, but what are we doing with these smart boards? Are we writing on them as if they're chalkboards? Or we have tools like uh, document cameras. And then if you can see in this image, the, the teacher is using a compass to demonstrate some principle in mathematics. Well, they did that in 1957 too. Giant wooden compasses did the trick just as well. Or now we ask kids to do things in mathematics using an iPad. But what are they doing on that iPad? Are they writing on the iPad much the same way they could write on a piece of paper? Or now we have online uh, mathematics courses where students can learn mathematics. And what mathematics are they learning? Are they learning the mathematics that was necessary in 1957? Computational skills? And are students passively just trying to get that green check mark to show up on that screen. And it just makes me wonder, are we using 2018 technology to teach mathematical necessities of 1957? In fact, I often walk out of classrooms, and this is not to uh, speak poorly of teachers. I love my teachers. They're doing their best. But I leave often, and the, the thought that flashes through my brain is what Vince Lombardi once said during one of the early Super Bowls. He said, what the hell's going on out here? And that's what I think, what, what, is, what are we doing? Here's some recent experiences I've had. Now, if you don't remember your mathematics, trust me that these are computational skills that had a necessity historically at one point in time. Rationalizing, rationalizing denominators, completing squares, factoring, the rational root theorem, Kramer's rule, the Mavra's theorem. And you might think, well, they're probably using antiquated textbooks to teach these old computations. But no, these textbooks are things like college algebra today, modern calculus, pre-calculus now. 
And what I think the title of these books should be is something more like this, Making Sense of Obsolete Mathematics. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't teach those things, but we shouldn't teach them as though we need human computers to do those things. But from, as a mathematician, to look at them from a historical perspective is very interesting, and making sense of those ideas is very interesting. But we teach it like it's 1957. If you want to evaluate a function, trust me on this one as well, there's some mathematics that can be done called synthetic substitution to evaluate a function. But if the goal of our education is to help students to arrive at a correct answer, if that's the only goal, and by the way, many of our assessments make it seem like that's the only goal, then if getting the right answer is the only goal, then I say, give them a computer. Give them a computer that has an, a free app. This one's called Desmos. And with this free app, I can find the solution to that problem just as easily without having to go through the laborious calculations that we needed in 1957. In fact, I get more. I get a graph. I can see what that solution means. I get actually more information from that than without. It is 2018. And if getting the right answer is the only goal, then I say, give them Desmos. It's free. It's easy to use. And it's on my phone. But I don't think that's what we should be doing in math education today. I think we should be doing something else. And so here's the challenge. I want to help students to make sense of mathematics and to develop problem solving skills, not just be human computers. And there's a great need. This image here is from a study. 60 plus thousand students entered into what we call at the college level developmental mathematics. They were not prepared for college level mathematics. And the, the highlight of this graph is what you see on the other end. They entered in and only 11% of these 60,000 plus students got to the other end. We have a problem. It shouldn't be this way. We shouldn't allow this to happen, and we need to fix the system. And I have a, a way, a thought, on how we might start by fixing this system. First of all, let's change what mathematics is to, to people. It shouldn't be this image of nonsense and things that don't make sense and endless symbols. Mathematics should be this. It should include four things. Making sense of problems. Asking the right question. Determining what information do you need to know to solve the problem. And then in, to engage in mathematics with intention and purpose. And then we might create a mathematical model to represent that situation. We say, let's mathematize this real life situation. Once we mathematize it, then there might be a need for some computations and procedures. Computations and procedures that might be better done with a computer. And then when we're done with that stage, then we think, well, let's, what does this mean? What is it? Let's interpret our results. Let's verify. Let's justify. What do we now know because we engaged in this? And the problem is, for decades, most of our math education has been centered on this, computations and procedures. And we've skipped the other three. We've done the one thing that a computer can do well, and we've skipped the three things that we need humans to do. So what should we do? I say we need to engage students in meaningful mathematics, not lecture at them. We need to focus on making sense of the mathematics. We need to help students to become effective and persistent problem solvers. These are the things that are going to lead to a change in education. We have data that suggests that we should really engage in this now. This study talks about how lectures are not only boring, but ineffective. And they claim in this, in this study that uh, lectures are 1.5 times more likely to fail students than an environment that is stimulating and what we call active learning. This study showed that it would be almost unethical to continue a predominantly lecture-based education system given what we know. And there's an abundance of proof that lecturing is an outmoded, outdated, ineffective method of teaching and learning. Now, in addition to that, there are things out there now called MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses. If you want to learn something, you can log into your computer and you can see an MIT professor, you can see somebody teaching that thing, 
And this study showed that watching something from your computer at home is just as effective as going into the classroom and seeing it face to face. So it says if you're going to learn, you might as well learn at home in your bunny slippers. There's a, another tool out there maybe you've run across called Khan Academy. And so for my teacher friends, if what we do in the classroom is what people could do at home on Khan Academy, that is, if we could be replaced by Khan Academy, then we probably should be. What do we offer in education that is going to be more than what somebody can access from home on their computer? So I've been trying to engage my students in active learning, problem solving, real life um, problems for years. And I got a letter recently from a student, her name is Patty well, uh, Wilson, and she says, you don't remember me, but I did. <laughs> but I was in your math program 15 to 17 years ago. It started in algebra and finally completed, I, I completed calculus three when I transferred to the university. I was unable to complete my engineering degree due, due to family issues, so I continued in my career as a nurse. But I will never regret math education, the math education you and your colleagues provided. I wanted to let you know how valuable the education has come to me in recent years. My company has a retirement plan with a pension. The original plan was exponential in nature. That's a good thing if we're investing. Which significantly rewards long-term employees for their loyalty. However, three years ago, the corporation made a change to the pension and quietly and subtly posted it under an obscure link within a deep link in our employee homepage. The description of the new formula change was vague and filled with positive sounding buzzwords. To the average nurse, the pension change might seem like a good thing, or at least as good as the old one. To an average nurse, that is. But to the nurse who can recognize the difference between a linear and exponential formula, I knew right away that this was not a good thing, nor was it legal. From the math skills I developed in your program, I was able to describe the change and create a line graph that demonstrated how each employee was going to lose a great deal of pension funds because of the change to a, to a linear formula. I shared this information with my coworkers and employer. The employer admitted to the ruse, but would not budge. I was also able to show lawyers who are now suing my employer. The court documents written by the lawyers include my line graph and calculations based on a hypo hypothetical employee that will be seen by a judge and will likely and hopefully result in the restoration of our pension. This amounts to millions of dollars or, uh, for thousands of future retirees of this huge corporation. So just a little feedback from a satisfied student from so many years ago. My coworkers marvel at my ability to analyze such obscure data and take away such results. To me, it's obvious, but that would not have always been the case. Prior to my math education, I would not have been able to make heads nor tails of it either. When students are taught to think, reason, problem solve, make sense, in addition to their computational skills, great things can happen. So I think we need to make a change. And together, we can make this change in math education. I'd like to take a moment to talk to parents. Parents, support your teachers when, they, when you see innovation happening, encourage it and support it. Parents, get involved in your students' uh, education. Get involved in their classroom at all levels and find out what's going on. And share your own experiences. Parents, you know that you have not had to factor a quadratic trinomial since ninth grade algebra. <laughs> so share what kinds of thinking and problem solving and data analysis do you need maybe in your profession and share that with your kids and your schools. Students, ask questions. I think we've got to a point in math education where students just say, yeah, math is always just this way. I don't really understand it. I just have to do it. And students, I challenge you to ask questions and find out why are we learning this? What good is it? Why does this make sense? Expect more from your education. Expect to be challenged and to be, uh, uh, have the opportunity to solve real problems. And when you do, understand that it could be more challenging. And when you have to engage in what we like to call productive struggle, engage in that productive struggle positively. Administrators, support your teachers and provide training so they can move from that old school mind mentality of, of computations to how can we engage students in authentic and meaningful problem solving. Support and encourage innovation. 
there are so many great technological tools that we can use appropriately to produce effective problem solvers. Administrators can help to encourage such innovation. And administrators understand the issues. We are not teaching to prepare students for a 1957 world when Sputnik. We're preparing students for a world that we don't even know about in the future. So understand the issues and how we can overcome them. Teachers, provide your opportunity, opportunities for your students to struggle productively to become problem solvers and not just showcase your knowledge. Support that productive struggle. Encourage students to work through it. It's challenging, but it's important. And listen to and follow student thinking. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've offered up a, an open-ended, unique problem se uh, setting, and students approach it in a way that I never would have thought of. And I have learned so much from my students by giving them the opportunity to think, reason, and share their own thinking with me and the class. We can't do this alone, though. I can't do it alone in my own classroom, my own school, my own state. We need to work together. Parents, administrators, teachers, students, the community, we are all brighter together, and we can change mathematics education for the better when we work together. Thank you very much. Thank you.